Um, all right, uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, and tonight's an exciting night because we're going to start a new sutra. Um, so fun for that. Um, as usual, I don't have any plan. As usual, I've never read this sutra. <laughs> um, so lot to get into, a lot to explain. Um, so let's start with why I chose this sutra. So this sutra is going to be called the Manifestation of Lights. It does have a fancy long Sanskrit name that I'll get into in a second. Um, and I'm going to talk all about it. But as you can tell, it's called this Manifestation of Lights. And I decided to kind of um, mix our sutras and transition from our Sri Maladevi Sutra into this sutra, because you, if you were here, you may recall that our last sutra, the Sri Maladevi Simhanada Sutra, you may recall that it ended with the Buddha emitting this great light and illuminating kind of the entire assembly. And that happened at the end of the sutra. It is not the first time that we've seen that um, in the Dharma doors here. And so I kind of thought it would be appropriate to sort of transition out of that sutra and into this sutra, which is exclusively about this idea of the emanation or the manifestation of lights. Um, let's do a little bit of technical work first. Um, so this is going to be another sutra from our Maharatnakuta Sutra collection. So that's right, we're sticking to our collection. And so if you've been coming to the Dharma Doors for a while now, you know that we've been mainly reading sutras from this a uh, very large collection of sutras. It's actually in its uh, main form. It consists of 49 different sutras, some of which, by the way, are very long. Not all 49 of these sutras have been translated into English. And this book, the yellow book <laughs> that I hold up most Sunday nights, so this is a book that if, if, you, you know, if you've been wondering about this and I haven't mentioned it for a while, this is a book called A Treasury of Mahayana Sutras, Selections from the Maharatnakuta Sutra. So this is only some of the sutras in the Maharatnakuta collection. We are going to be reading from sutra number 11. And what's interesting tonight is that you may know, if you've been coming to Dharma Doors, that this is a really strange little book. <laughs> it's the only English translation of the, the sutras from the Ratnakuta collection. And so the first thing they did is they didn't translate all of the sutras, which again is understandable. Some of them are very long. The next thing they do, though, is, is that even though the 49 sutras in the Ratnakuta collection, even though they have specific numbers, like the first one is the first one all the way up to the last one, they, in this book, decided to kind of put them in a different order and give them all different numbers, which doesn't make it helpful if you're trying to do any kind of comparison. However, we got lucky with this one, because it is both the 11th sutra of the Ratnakuta collection and it's number 11 in the book. So this is the one occasion, like the proverbial broken clock that is right twice a day, they got it right this one time. Um, so that's the kind of mainly where we're looking. Um, but as usual, I'm kind of working on my own translation of this sutra, which is primarily what I'm going to read from tonight. I will probably have a reason or two to refer back to the sutra. 
Um, so that's the source of this. Um, you may know also, if you've been coming to the Dharma Doors, that <clears throat> the sutras in the Maharatna Kuta collection, they do all exist, of course, in the Chinese language. And that's where these translations, sorry, these translations are coming from, are from the Chinese. There is also a complete Tibetan version of the Maharatna Kuta collection. Some of those have been translated into English, but not all of them. And unfortunately, there, there is a group, uh, I believe their website is read 84,000, or they're the, they're the group associated with that website, read 84,000. And they are doing, they are in the process of translating from Tibetan, the Maharatna Kuta collection, but they haven't done this sutra yet. It says that it is in process. And what that means is, is that this is the only reference that we have other than the Chinese edition of Bodhiruchi, which is what I'm going to be referring to. And that's what this is a translation of. Okay, so that's our sutra for tonight. Um, let's talk the title. Because we have a complete Tibetan version of this sutra, from the Tibetan, we can reconstruct what the original Sanskrit title of this sutra probably was. Um, in fact, there is also a, a um, it's kind of a essay, a commentary, I believe it's written by Shantideva, that lists all the titles of the sutras in this Maharatna Kuta collection. And so we do know pretty much with some certainty that the original Sanskrit title of this sutra would have been something like Rash Misa Manta Mukta, Nirdesha Sutra, which basically means <clears throat> manifesting lights, manifesting lights, but it's actually a Nirdesha Sutra. And you may recall that of the sutras in this collection, some of them are about the prophecy, receiving the prophecy of enlightenment, for example, and those are the uh, Vikaranya sutras. There are various pure land sutras that describe different pure lands. And then there's kind of a family of sutras that are called Nirdesha sutras. And a Nirdesha is basically a Q&A, question and answer. And so this is the questions or the nirdesha, questions concerning the manifestation of lights. <clears throat> That's what we're talking about. Um, before I even begin to read this, I want to, um, I want to pique your curiosity a little bit about this, this idea of light. Um, I'm going to repeat a few of the remarks that I made at the last, uh, at the end of the last sutra regarding light. I have a few more things to add to the remarks that I made. So this is, you know, this is a really interesting topic. Um, I, I have to tell you, I found it interesting. The, the, um, the first footnote, the, the first footnote of our manifestation of lights says that among the sutras presented in this volume, the manifestation of lights is perhaps the most difficult to comprehend. The central question concerns the meaning of this so-called light of the Buddha. Is it simply a kind of luminous entity such as rays or beams of light, or is it spiritual illumination? the mystical light reported of by meditators. <laughs> to give an exact, exact answer is difficult, indeed. Uh, and then it goes on. So it even says that this is kind of one of the more difficult to comprehend sutras in the collection. It's definitely going to be one of the, the weirdest, maybe the most psychedelic of this collection. 
Um, I don't find it that, you know, you know, crazy in that way. I, but I think I'm re really used to these in that sense. So let's talk about light in Buddhism really quickly. Um, even before we start reading the sutra, I want to kind of have these ideas in the air, so to speak. I want to have them kind of fresh in our minds. So rather than digressing after I start to read the sutra, I'd rather sort of just kind of, again, have this conversation. The, the metaphor of light, not even quite sure what to call it, to call it a metaphor, the image, this, this idea of the Buddha emanating light. It's a pretty common theme, specifically of Mahayana Buddhist sutras. In fact, you probably, in fact, I don't recall ever seeing this type of image in an earlier Pali Sutta. So this is very much within the territory of Mahayana Buddhism. It's part of that more narrative, story-like form of sutra, very much like the sutras that are in the Maharatna Kutta collection. And I mentioned last time that one of the go-to places for the idea of this image of light in Buddhism, one of the primary go-to places is the famous Lotus Sutra. And the reason why I say that is, is because the Lotus Sutra, even if you haven't read the Lotus Sutra, you know, that's, that's fine. But the idea is, is that, uh, it, you know, it, it goes on for many pages with all of the names of the bodhisattvas that were in attendance, let alone all of the heavenly beings, the Nagas, the Yakshas, Gandharavas, so on and so on. So the first thing that actually happens in the Lotus Sutra is that it says at that time, once everybody had gathered around, the Buddha emitted a ray of light from the tuft of white hair between his eyebrows, one of his feature, one of his characteristic features. And this light lit up 18,000 worlds in the Eastern direction there was no place that the light did not penetrate, reaching downward as far as the lowest regions of hell and upward to the highest regions of heaven. From this world, all, all sorry, from this world, one could see the living beings in all paths of existence in all other lands. One could likewise see the Buddhas present at that time in all those other lands and could hear the sutra teachings which those Buddhas were expounding. At the same time, one could see all the monks, the nuns, the laymen, the lay women who had carried out religious practices and attained the way in all of those other lands. One could also see the bodhisattvas and great beings who, through various causes and conditions and various types of faith and understanding, and in various forms and aspects, were all carrying out the way of the bodhisattva. And one could see the Buddhas who had already entered final nirvana and could also see how, after the Buddhas have entered parinirvana, towers adorned with the seven treasures were all erected for the Buddha relics. Okay. That just begins the sutra. And then what I didn't read was there begins a conversation between two bodhisattvas about this light. What's up with this light is basically what one of the bodhisattvas says. Where's, where's this light coming from? is basically the question. So that's the entire reason for the Lotus Sutra is uh, it's about this light that the Buddha emits. And one of the things that I want you to notice is that when the Buddha emitted that light, everything became clear, everything could be seen, all 
these different beings in different paths of existence, even Buddhas that had already passed, Buddhas preaching the Dharma, Bodhisattvas. So that's one of the aspects of the light within Buddhism is that it reveals things. It shows things. It allows for things to be seen in that way. That's just the Lotus Sutra. I want you all to know too, I probably, it may be a while before I ever get around to teaching this sutra, but there is a very, very important Mahayana Buddhist sutra called the Sutra of Golden Light, the Suvarna, Suvarna Vasotta, Vasottama Sutra, something to that effect. Um, this is a really important Mahayana Sutra. This is, I believe, the only English translation by this guy, Emmerich. And um, I mention this only because it's such an important sutra that's also centered around this image of the light, the, this particularly the golden light emanated by the Buddha. That's a, a very important, or at least historically important sutra because it speaks about this kind of light of the Buddha, this revealing light that I'm talking about, but also as a kind of protective light, a guarding light in that sense. That's kind of the one of the focuses of that sutra. And, you know, I actually, I have other sutras here, but I'm, I think I'm going to pause there. My point is, is that this light imagery pops up, pops up a lot. <laughs> Um, it's, it's really deeply a part of the Mahayana tradition. And so what's up with this light, right? <laughs> As they will say, well, if you go looking in a good Buddhist dictionary or encyclopedia, they will automatically list either two kinds of light that are discussed in Buddhism, or sometimes three kinds of light that are used within Buddhism. The footnote the footnote that I read a moment ago sort of referenced these two kinds of light. So the two kinds of light are what we would call maybe photonic light, terrestrial light. Uh, so light from lamps, light from the sun, physical light, so to speak, that is perceived by the eyes. The second kind of light is what is just called usually the light of wisdom, the light of knowledge. That's the dictionary entry. Um, and that's, I wanna talk a little bit more about that. That's sort of what I spoke about at the end of last sutra, but I wanna mention it again. And then if you look further, you'll find sometimes that there's three kinds of light. So regular old terrestrial light, the light of wisdom or knowledge, and then a third kind of light, which is a golden light, but it's a golden light that's emanated from the bodies of maybe gods, heavenly beings, uh, sages, bodhisattvas, things like that. So Buddhism sort of distinguishes those three kinds of light. Oh, and by the way, that third light I just mentioned, the golden light of gods or bodhisattvas, the important thing about that kind of light is that it's a kind of, um, what's the word, refulgent, I believe. It's, it's self-luminating self versus terrestrial light, which is actually reflective, right? So terrestrial light sort of bounces off things and causes them to be seen. The third kind of light, though, the, the being is giving it off of themselves not being a reflective of some other source of light in that way. So those are sort of the basic three kinds of light that you'll encounter in Buddhist texts or Buddhist sutras. And there's often a discourse going on, a distinction being made between the two, meaning light, light that's seen by these physical eyes versus a kind of light that is not seen by the physical eyes. Maybe it's a kind of light seen by the third eye, this kind of deva eye, divine eye. That's actually the eye that would normally see that, that golden hue of gods and bodhisattvas. 
And then there is sort of this sort of eye of wisdom that doesn't correspond to the physical eye, it maybe sort of corresponds to mind, but that mind would then be the mind or the eye of that wisdom of that mind would be the eye that sees that light of knowledge, right? So let me mention that again, this light of knowledge. I wanna kind of create a, a metaphor to work with and then we'll start moving our way towards the sutra. So what I mentioned at the end of last session was that the metaphor, the basic metaphor that you can think of is the idea of being in a pitch black, dark room where you're fumbling around. You don't know how big the room is. You don't know what is inside the room. You don't know if there's you know, something to be uh, so it's something dangerous, you know, there's something, you just don't know. But then something happens, which is that somebody turns on a lamp or puts on a light. And all of a sudden, because of the lamp or because of the light, you can now see how big the room is. You can now see what is in the room. You can see if what you're looking at is dangerous or helpful or what have you. So the idea is, is that a moment ago, we were in the dark, quite literally, and we didn't know what was going on. But because of the light of the lamp, that photonic, reflective, terrestrial light, we now have, have we transitioned from a state of not knowing to knowing, ignorance to enlightenment in a certain literal sense, where things have lightened up. And I can see everything. What I mentioned last time was, is there's also a way to think about it like this. <clears throat> you could kind of imagine yourself fumbling through life, <laughs> not really sure about what's going on here, not really sure about what's dangerous or what's helpful, kind of in the dark about life about the world, about the me about meaning, significance, existence, and all of those things. And then maybe you take a Dharma class, or you take, so you read some books on Buddhism, and you learn about the Four Noble Truths. And you learn this very, very simple teaching that basically it's our striving and wanting and craving that's producing a sense of anxiety and stress that we, we set up these desires for ourselves and then frustrate ourselves in that sense. In other words, our own anxiety, stress, angst, dukkha, the suffering, is in a way being caused by the, this desperate clinging and this desperate wanting. And if you don't do that desperate clinging, desperate wanting, it, it gets easier less anxious, there's less to be anxious about. And the more you ease up on that grip, the less you suffer to the point where you can actually completely become unattached from needing things in this world. And you can be completely released from suffering. Now that teaching can sort of illuminate what's going on here doesn't always do it right away, but the idea is, is that it has the capacity to sort of turn on a light here. In other words, a moment ago, I, I was confused. Why, why am I suffering? Why is God doing this to me? Or why is this happening to me? Why, why, why? I'm very confused. I hear about the Four Noble Truths, and if it clicks, there's a way that I would move from ignorance to a kind of enlightenment. I would move from a kind of dim, deluded state to a more illuminated state, but it wouldn't be because of a physical lamp. It would be because of knowledge, because of wisdom. But again, that wisdom or that knowledge, it, it's not that alone that's going to illuminate this. It's going to be the mind that understands. And what I'm getting at is, is that when that happens, when 
the mind realizes, oh, wow, I'm doing this to myself in a really interesting way. I should stop doing that. But that when there's that realization, it's as if someone's turned on a light and we can now see what well, it was there the whole time, just like when we were in the dark room. Whatever was in the room was already in the room. We just couldn't see it. But because of the lamp, we can now see. Similarly, before we heard the Four Noble Truths, we might have been confused about what was going on here. And now we know. And that's like a light. And what I'm getting at here is, is that if you really kind of, you know, like really think about that, like really think about learning and it doesn't have to be as profound as the dharma as profound as the four noble truths it can really just be about learning and how before you took a class a class in whatever it could be a class in molecular biology but before you took the class you didn't really know how molecular biology worked you take a semester course you take a class and you now can see things that you couldn't see before, even though they were right there. So we're kind of trying to feel how knowledge is a type of light, like kind of really in a way, if you kind of make those comparisons between what is light, like what is light really doing? in that way. And what I mean is, is like, even if I were to take, I was just thinking about like my phone, oh, it's dark. <laughs> I don't know what time it is. Oh, it's the light that just revealed to me in that way, what time it is. And so, yeah, we can get, you know, get all excited about electrons and about, you know, light in that sense. But what I am kind of suggesting is, is to look at the role of light in illuminating and then notice oh other things could serve that same purpose or serve that same function and then to start to refer to them as light as actually kind of like light it, it just becomes interesting at that point like where it maybe ceases to almost be a metaphor if if everybody knows what i mean or 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 even it, more interesting Maybe this, this light is a metaphor for knowledge. Oh. F flipped it on you there, right? So, but, okay. So things are going to get funky. I'm, I'm actually preparing you for this sutra because it's so kind of wild. So we need to really be in the right frame of mind. Um, speaking of which, I have one more um, uh, um, interesting way of thinking about light. And this is one that I think will, in a way, actually really interestingly uh, bridge, the, bridge a gap between what I've been calling terrestrial light, ref reflective light, photonic light, and this light of knowledge or wisdom. Check this one out. So I'm here, I just, I just showed you, I have this lamp, right? So that's one lamp. Um, and then I have a couple more lamps in the room. If it were daytime, there might even be sunlight, but it's nighttime, time changed. So there's no sun to be found now. And so I just have these two lamps. And the idea here is, is that if I turn these lamps off, I'd be in that dark room that I mentioned. But what I'm getting at is, is that these lamps, and when I turn it on, this lamp, they create this reflective light and it's how I see what's going on in the room. And actually, I guess there's a kind of a, another light, which is the screen of the computer, which is also luminous projecting light, photonic light, and it's how I can see you all, right? So my point is the, the source, the source of illumination here that allows me to see are the two lamps 
and the computer screen, right? All right. <laughs> now I want you to think about or imagine that you're having a dream that this is happening, that you're not, you know, you're not really, this is, it's not really Sunday night. You actually fell asleep. You're taking a nap kind of a situation and you think you're at the Dharma doors in that way, right? So now here we are <clears throat> and I'm going to use me. So now here I am, but it's a dream and I see the two lamps and I have this lamp. <clears throat> The question, though, the really, you know, thought-provoking question is, what's the source of illumination in a dream? Is it the dream lamps? <clears throat> Little dream light bulbs <laughs> Do they, that are all getting their energy from the dream sun? So there's like a sun in my dream world that's powering the dream electrical power plant that's powering. I don't think that's the source of illumination in a dream. <clears throat> and yet there we are in a dream and we are able to see things. How is it that we are able to see things in a dream? Again, what is the source of illumination? Where does, the, where does the luminosity that we see in a dream, where does it come from, right? And the basic idea, of course, is, you know, not to leave you out there too long, but one could say the mind. The, the mind of the dreamer is the source of illumination. And I would say, yeah, I think that's exactly right. And the idea is, is that, that, that light in a dream that actually appears to us, like it actually appears uh, luminous in a way, and yet it is the mind, I am suggesting that, that that light of wisdom or that light of knowledge in a dream may actually become literally luminous in that sense. I'm not actually wanting to make any definitive statements about the nature of light in a dream. I actually just want to provoke, <laughs> uh, poke, <laughs> and get you to kind of think about the oddity of that, that, that there is light <laughs> in a dream. And, and actually, you can imagine in a dream going into a dark room and then going out into the daylight. You could imagine those things, but then you would again have to wonder what is the actual ultimate final source of that light? Okay, so those are some ideas about light. We've got uh, light of wisdom and knowledge, light of the illuminated mind or something to that effect. Um, we just got a lot of different ideas of light going on here. And again, my main point was to not de really define anything, but I actually kind of wanted to, to um, kind of refract, you know, pardon the expression, but I kind of wanted to complicate the nature of light going into this so that we would already have a much uh, broader sense of light so that we wouldn't be literally thinking of the Buddha as necessarily emitting light beams in that sense, like, you know, like a lamp in that way. Okay. Any questions, comments, answers, ideas about light in Buddhism? That's really all we've talked about so far. <laughs> cool. So let's get into this. Oh, yeah, Jenny. But it's not just where the light is coming from, it's how it's being perceived. Because, yeah, in a dream, <laughs> not our eyes. Excellent. See, Jenny cracked the code. She, got, she cracked the heart suture code. No eye, no ear, no nose, tongue, body, or mind. <laughs> okay. 
Um, let's get into it. So this is um, um, this manifesting of lights. Um, here we go. Can I make a comment about the light? Actually? Yes, please. please. I'd um, love to hear it. Uh, the few times in the past, um, I've had like kind of, you know, dark and scary dreams. Um, it's not often, but it's happened a couple of times in my life. And in those dreams, I'll try to turn a lamp on and I can never do it. A Angela, you actually, yeah, you reminded me that there is a kind of a um, a thing about light switches in dreams that I know a lot of um, a lot of people who explore the dream space are often interested in the fact of, of how dr uh, light switches often don't work in dreams. Right. Yeah. And, and it all points to the mysterious nature of light in the dream, in the dream world, in the dream state, in that sense. Absolutely. All right. <clears throat> okay. So here we go. Um, not much more to it than that. So thus have I heard. Once the Buddha was in Rajgriha on Mount Gridrakuta, the vulture's peak, accompanied by 500 great bhikshus, all of whom had fully achieved great freedom. There were also 80 nayutas of bodhisattva mahasattvas, all just one lifetime away from reaching final Buddhahood, headed by bodhisattva Maitreya. There were also 40 nayutas of other great bodhisattvas headed by the Dharma Prince Manjushri. At that time, from among the assembly, a young boy known as Moonlight arose from his seat, bared his right shoulder, knelt with his right knee on the ground and bowed down on the ground with his head at the Buddha's feet, then joined his palms reverentially together and said to the Buddha, World honored one, what karmic actions has the thus come one, the Tathagata practiced in order to be able to attain such certain light? The embracing light, generating light, manifesting light, all kinds of colors of lights, indistinguishable light, narrow light, broad light, pure light, universal pure light, undefiled light, most undefiled light, stainless light, gradually increasing light, sparkling pure light, the most sparkling pure light, boundless light, most boundless light, immeasurable light, most immeasurable light, measureless light, most measureless light, swift light, most swift light, non-abiding light, light with no abode, the blazing light, illuminating light, delightful light, light that reaches the other shore, light unable to be obstructed, immovable light, straightforward light, light that abides in infinitude, colored light, all kinds of colors of lights, measureless colors, of lights, blue, yellow, red, white, all kinds of colors, red colored light, crystal colored light, space colored light, all kinds of lights such as this, each one intermingling with the lights of the five colors, blue, yellow, red, white, and so on. And each one appears mixed with innumerable, boundless, different kinds of colored light. All right. That's our young boy, Moonlight, 
That's the question. <laughs> so if you miss the question, the question is, what karmic actions, what has the Tathagata done in order to generate this light, this embracing light, this generating light, manifesting light, so on and so on. All this, these different types of light. Okay, any questions about that? I mean, that is the question that is to be answered, but before we hear even the beginning of the Buddha's answer, anything jump out at anybody? Okay, so let's get into the Buddha's answer. Oh, by the way, too, so that you know, in terms of the form of this, this is one of those sutras that's actually just a very long poem. Um, it has two very small narrative sections. In fact, I, I just read to you the first narrative section, which is about um, all of the bodhisattvas and bhikshus that were at the on Mount uh, Gridrakuta. The rest is in poetry and the Buddha answers moonlight in verse. So then the world honored one replied to moonlight in verse saying, it is due to inconceivable virtuous karmic actions that I have been completely freed of confusion and have achieved all kinds of lights. It is also due to all kinds of practices, abiding in the way of the Buddhas and by, the, and by wisdom, sorry, and by the wisdom of emptiness and the wisdom of non-doing, such intermingled light emerges. It's like all external phenomena, all external dharmas, differentiated by all kinds of characteristics, when within they are mere empty thoughts, without self, without action, without mind. It is also like the internal body, empty too, without self, without a doer, when within it is able to manifest all kinds of sounds. Just as there is no doer, manifesting boundless different colored lights according to whatever delights the mind, causing it to attain fulfillment. Sometimes it is from a single light that two colors of light emerge each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. Differentiated is how they appear. Sometimes it is from a single light that three colors of light emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. Differentiated is how they appear. Sometimes it is from a single light that four colors of light emerge, each with an upper, middle, and lower. Differentiated is how they appear. Sometimes it is from a single light that five colors of light emerge, each with an upper, middle, and a lower. It is the result of pure karmic action that they arise. Sometimes it is from a single light that six colors of light emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. It is from upaya, skillful means, that that light arises. Sometimes it is from a single light that seven colors of light emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. It is from virtuous karmic action that they arise. Sometimes it's from a single light that eight colors of light emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. It is from superior virtues that that light arises. 
Sometimes it's from a single light that nine colors of light emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. It is from Sambraha, supplies for the body and the mind that they arise. And sometimes it is from a single light that 10 colors of light emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. It is from generosity, dana, that they arise. All right, I'm going to pause there because it's, it's, got, it's getting weird already. I, I know. Um, so let me actually do this. Okay. Really quickly, just to let you know, this original English translation, the world honored one replies to moonlight and says, by inconceivable good karmas, I have rid myself of delusions and have achieved various lights. By all kinds of virtuous practices, I abide securely in the Buddha's path. By the wisdom of emptiness and non-action, I emanate intermingled lights. Empty, egoless, inactive, and devoid of thought are all external things, and yet they can manifest different forms. Empty, egoless, and inactive is the body, and yet it can produce various sounds. In the same way, through the wisdom of non-action, I can manifest innumerable colored lights to satisfy the wishes of all sentient beings. Sometimes one light can produce two colors, each radiating three beams, higher, middle, and lower. And then they just drift off. They stop. They, they do the dots thing. So we know that this book has this terrible problem of just inserting ellipses and being like, bye, we're done translating the sutra now. So it just ends there, picks up at a much later point in the sutra. So let's kind of go through that initial part, try to break it down, try to make sense of it. So... The one thing that if you read the whole Lotus Sutra, if you read the Sutra of Golden Light I mentioned, if you read all these other sutras that are talking about the Buddha emanating these lights, there's definitely this one theme that you start to hear, which is that it's from lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes of past virtuous practice that the Buddha can now emanate this light. So it said it right away. It's, it is due to inc inconceivable virtuous karmic action that I have been completely freed from confusion and have achieved all kinds of lights. So in that sense, we are to understand these lights as being you know, indicative of the Buddha's enlightened state in that way, that, that that's sort of their relationship. They speak to lifetimes of past practice. Okay, again, that's sort of what you would hear in a lot of other sutras, that idea. Then the next part it says is that it is also due to all kinds of virtuous practices abiding in the way of the Buddhas. And by the wisdom of emptiness and non-doing, it is from that that intermingled light appears. So let's kind of talk about that theme. So the theme that got introduced right away is the theme of emptiness, but in particular, the theme of non-action, okay? What you can also translate as non-doing. So we're gonna talk about that. But the, the poem, the Buddha's poem here, it starts to make really clear that that's kind of a connecting point 
that these lights, like let's say you want to emanate some lights. <laughs> if you want to emanate some lights, it's going to require this knowledge of emptiness and knowledge of non-action. All right. So yeah, let's kind of break that down for a little bit and then we'll kind of start to piece together the rest of this. So emptiness, of course, is pretty, <laughs> is pretty straightforward, right? <laughs> as soon as i say it it's like oh no here we go i gotta <laughs> explain emptiness real quick um you know it's always a tricky one that emptiness idea right um yeah so you know the basic idea i'm looking at my wheel like if, by the way, if you don't know, I have my my wheel of upaya, right? So if, I've never shown you this. This is my where I can grab the, the necessary prop. So I keep that on deck. So let's <laughs> so let's deal. I'll, I'll chose this one. So this is a good example of emptiness. Um, so, but in particular let's talk about what's empty i like to use this example this is a great optical illusion but the example that i always like to walk people through is it's the funny example of um there's a there's a knock at the door <gasps> Ooh. and you go running over and look through the little peephole and let's say that you're with uh, somebody else so there's two of you and you look through the peephole and you see that, <laughs> but then your, your roommate or your housemate or whoever, they look through the peephole and they see that, <laughs> right? And the idea here is, is I like to paint this kind of hypothetical scenario where the first person sees two faces and thinks two people have come over to their house. And this person, the first person, they kind of have social anxiety. And so they're not actually really excited <laughs> that two strangers have showed up at their door, right? <laughs> so in other words, it's not just that they see, when they look through the people, it's not just that they see two people, but there's also this feeling of, of, of dukkha, right? Of anxiety or something from these two people. So, person A starts to get a little nervous and person B is like, why are you so nervous? Somebody left us a, a glass of champagne. <laughs> we should, we should rejoice. I, I love, I love drinking. I love champagne. So person number two is really excited. They're really excited because somebody dropped off a glass or a goblet of champagne. So now we have these two different perceptions. <laughs> perception A is two people. Perception B is that it's a glass. But on top of the perception, we have this kind of what we could call a vedana, a sensory reaction, which is that person A is having a negative reaction to this. And person B is having a positive reaction. They're very, they're excited about this glass of champagne they're not so excited about these two people. So what's interesting is that they could then be like, no, it's not a glass, people, like, you know, so they could start to get into this little debate. And then it's like, well, no, 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 let's go check. And so they go back up to the door and instead of looking through the peephole, they listen. And the first person hears, <laughs> And they say, see, it's two people. I heard them whispering. The second person listens and they hear, and they say, no, that's the bubbles from the champagne. It's effervescent. That's the sound of the champagne. So now <laughs> their initial perception has informed their secondary perception because since they were convinced that it was two people or they're convinced it was a glass, what they're gonna hear is going to be informed by that. This is what we call samskara. 
conditioning. So we've been conditioned to then see it one way or the other. And when we come back for that second visit, it's difficult to get out of the rut, to get out of that mental habit, that samskara of seeing it that way or that way. So the, of course the problem in terms of samskara is that once the person has heard that it's champagne or heard that it's two people whispering, now that samskara is really deep. Now both people are really convinced that they're right and the other person is wrong. And they could actually, you know, we could go over and smell, like do a whiff test and we could say, no, I can, I can smell it. I can smell them. And it's like, no, you're just smelling. They were at the bar earlier. You know, all these different scenarios where we could be smelling certain things a certain way, seeing things a certain way, all of that. Here's the situation. <laughs> Person A is convinced that there's two people out there. <laughs> Person B is convinced there's a glass. In person A's reality, those two people out there don't exist. <laughs> They're empty. And, not, and, and what emptiness is, is it's not even about, it's not a statement about their molecular structure. It's not a statement about space. It's actually a statement about delusion which is this idea that insofar as I'm convinced there's two people out there, the nature of those two people is that it's, they are not. The wisdom, the, the understanding is that my perception that there are two people is a dependently originated phenomena. It's dependently originating, pa partially due to if not entirely due to the conditioning of the mind, which is why I was emphasizing samskara. But here's the point though, the second person who is seeing a glass and they're like, no, there's a glass out there. The glass is empty. And I'm not talking about it half empty, half full empty. I'm talking about that there's no glass out there either. So the idea is, is that each person is experiencing what they're experiencing. They, they really are seeing what they're seeing. They're really believing they're seeing what they're seeing. Emptiness is a statement about that objective reality. And in particular, it's a statement that says this. In in normal reality, non-enlightened, non-Buddhist world, one of these people is right and one of them is wrong. One of them has seen the right thing and the other person has, has they've missed it. They got it wrong. They're delusional. Now, maybe that's the, the two faces and maybe it's the glass, right? But the idea is, is that one of us is right and one of us is wrong. Now, you could even go so far as to say, oh, well, wait, they're both wrong. Yes, that's a good statement. But if they are both wrong about something, like that there is something on the other side of the door and they've both got it wrong, if you believe that there's a really something on the other side of the door to be found, then that would be in what would be called an existent, right? A, an existing thing. <laughs> but emptiness is about that. <laughs> it is about that very idea that you may have of what is really out there on the other side of the door. And what emptiness is about is this realization or understanding that it is all dependently originated and for the most part dependent upon conditioning in that sense. And so emptiness is, again, it's a very subtle idea because it's not a statement about the thing out there, if, but it is only to say that there is not that thing out there. 
But what I mean, what I'm kind of getting at regarding this idea of emptiness is that my, my cup, my cup's not empty. There's just no cup. That's emptiness. It's a very, very subtle distinction. But the point is, is that when you say the cup is empty, you've already missed it. You missed it by, by saying there was a cup that is now empty. Emptiness is a much grander statement about the nature of all phenomena, actually, as being all dependently originated in that way. And ultimately, if you go looking for the real deal, uh, Kant's, the thing in itself, right, that idea of the real deal, the basic idea of emptiness is, oh, you will just be chasing these samskaras. You just be chasing all of these conditioned thought patterns in that way. Okay, everybody good with that idea of emptiness? Excellent. So now we go the step further. Now we go into pranya. We're going into the pranya level wisdom. Pranya wisdom is uh, a one step beyond what we were just talking about. And what I mean is, is this, in my scenario, I said that there was these two people, right? And they were observing this phenomena on the other side of the door. And we just talked about how emptiness applies to that perception of either two people, the two people are empty, they don't exist like that, or the glass is empty, it doesn't exist like that. The next step though, is to recognize that the very, self-reflexive thought about oneself that what you're viewing yourself through a peephole and imagining yourself as who you, you know whatever your name is whatever your occupation is all of this and so the idea is is the the pranya level wisdom is the realization that oh the perceiving self is empty too the perceiving self is empty too and it just keeps going by because if you're if you want to ask the question well then who is misperceiving or what is misperceiving the it just goes on and on and that's basically called samsara that's that idea it's this kind of never-ending chain of causation in that sense everybody follow me on the pranya level where it doesn't just apply to things out there, it applies to who you think is doing the viewing. Also this dependently originated phenomena and therefore empty in that way. That idea, if you get the pranya level, how emptiness applies to the self as well, if you get that, then we can talk about what the sutra describes as this idea of non-action or non-doing. So the idea of that is, is that part of the, part of the grand illusion here is a sense of agency, a sense of being a willing actor in that way. But if I just told you that the nature of the self is empty and there is no you there, then what is performing the action? And the idea is, is that there is, there is, that is part of the illusion, is the idea of action in that sense. Everybody follow me on that? This is like, yeah. So that, I, I'm, I'm happy that we got to this point. So that way of seeing and understanding in terms of emptiness, where we understand everything as being a kind of dependently originated phantasm, a dependently originated mirage, as the Buddha would say. So 
seeing the world in terms of emptiness, but also turning that gaze back to, onto the self and realizing the same thing about the self. And then that leading to this sense or an understanding of no action, of no cause and effect in that way, no before and after in that way, if you're with that, with the emptiness and the non-doing, well, that's apparently when these lights start to show up. <laughs> because that's what they're kind of telling us here, is this idea, right, that it's by the wisdom of emptiness and the wisdom of non-doing that these intermingled lights manifest and appear. And then the, the, um, this translation is, is at the moment better than mine. I'm still working on mine, but it set up a couple of interesting things here. And the one was, it talks about how it is also like the internal body, the idea of the inside of you. It says it is also like the internal body, empty as well, without self, without a doer, yet within, it is able to manifest all kinds of sounds. And then it goes on to say that just like that, just as there, are, there is no doer, but able to manifest all kinds of sounds, in the same way, the Buddha is saying that it is by that non-doing, that he is able to manifest all of these different lights. It's yeah, Tanya. Do you, did you, does this maybe also have anything to do with like, there's some meditations that where you're, you're supposed to like be non-doing, right? That's that help you kind of relax and see the nature of reality. Um, and so, is that at all maybe related to this? Is that like, is like the wild action colors, like the wisdom pouring out because he's seeing, you know, he's like in some sort of a non-doing meditative state? Yes. Um, I would, I hear what you're saying. And I, I would respond to that actually by kind of beginning, um, I would be, I would start to do an interesting contrast and the interesting contrast that I would suggest is the, a contrast between, let's say this fully, a fully enlightened Buddha deep in the wisdom of emptiness and non-doing and therefore manifesting or emerging all of this light contrast that to to me not manifesting all kinds of light but then i reflect on yeah but i'm i'm not a fully enlightened buddha and i'm not a fully enlightened buddha because i'm still pretty stuck in this subject object relationship in fact i'm still pretty stuck on this notion of myself i understand sort of intellectually the emptiness of self, I have glimpses of a, of a deeper understanding of that. But for the most part, I'm pretty deep on the idea of myself in that way. Uh, meaning I'm identifying with the dude on the driver's license and all of that. And so I'm, I'm me. And so, you know, like a lot of aspects of Buddhahood, Buddhahood is this idea of a non-dual state, not participating in the subject object relationship that way. I'm not a Buddha because I am participating in the subject object relationship or the dualistic one. The interesting thing, Tanya, that your question kind of made me think about is wanting to contrast how, how light would function in this version or this version, in the fully enlightened version or the diluted Michael subject object version. And what I mean by that is, is that when I am in 
a dualistic state of self and other, a big part of that is always going to be then here and therefore there, right? So that's part of the divide is not just me and you, but what comes along with that is this and therefore that here and therefore there, right? So you, you start to notice how as soon as you have any one of these divisions, you get the whole pile of them. And included along with that may then be a version of light that has to be reflective. And so if I were a fully enlightened Buddha, maybe light would in a way function differently because of being in a non-dual state, in, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. This all has to go back to my initial dream analogy, of course. And what I mean by that is, is that, you know, I always use the dream and the dream as an analogy um, with the basic idea that you can do a really, really good comparison of being in a dream and there and being like convinced it's reality. Like you're, you're, it's one of those dreams that you think is real. And so you really think there's lamps and light and all of these things happening. But then you become lucidly aware. Oh, wait, this is a dream. It's not a real lamp. I don't have actual eyes. This is all mind illuminated in that way. I always use the dream analogy because I, my understanding of awakening, of Bodhi, is that they're saying that we are like, it's like we're asleep. It's like we're in a dream world here. And there's a way to become, uh, um, well, there's a way to become lucid in the waking life. And they call it Bodhi. They call it waking up. <laughs> and the idea is, is that just like before when you were dreaming, but you thought it was reality. And so you, maybe it was a nightmare or whatever. And then you realize, oh, this is just a dream. Buddhism, Buddha is saying, same thing's happening here. This is kind of like a dream and it's freaking us out, <laughs> but there's a enlightened state of, of a, a being that is like lucid, lucidly living. And it raises your disposition on this reality. You're no longer afraid of it like a nightmare. You're no longer desirous of it. Like as if it were a dream, like as if it were dream money. Right. So that's the idea. And so what I'm suggesting is, is that if, if there, if Buddhahood, it would have a similar relationship to light in this world. And they, they describe this. This is not just me talking crazy. It's like, that's the very idea is light. The nature of light would change and it would almost kind of have to, if you know what I mean because of this duality versus non-duality thing that I'm describing. Time, I mean, time changes in that. I'll, you know, I think everybody likes or enjoys these kinds of conversations and I, I love these kinds of conversations. So we'll go all night, but look at it this way too, regarding full Buddhahood and diluted duality, right? So once again, if you're Michael, then you're in this dualistic life situation. And part of that, of course, again, creates a this versus that. But then, like I said, there creates a here. And if there's here, then there's there. <laughs> and if, if there's here and there's there, then in order for me to, to be over there, I need to go over there. Oh, look, I'm over here now. I'm not over there. But if I were non-dual, if I were in a non-dual state, I would already be over there. There would be no here and there. I wouldn't be dividing this from that. It would, again, it would be non-dual. In other words, if I were in that non-dual state, I'm already there. Right? And now you see, well, if spatially things change like that, where here is there, 
then temporally, time-wise, things change as well, right? Because time's functioning the same way as far as, oh, look, now. <laughs> it's now, therefore, before, therefore, after. But if, again, that's all a byproduct of duality in that sense. And so if you're in a non-dual state, then time, in a sense, doesn't exactly collapse. It's not quite like that. But it's kind of like that if you understood my here is there situation, right? Because then if, he, if here is there in a non-dual state, then then is now in a non-dual state in that same logic. And again, they talk about this as a, as a description of Buddhahood, as being beyond time, beyond space, all of these things. So again, I would, I would imagine that light changes if you're beyond space and time. <laughs> um, actually, to go back even further to Tanya's question, though, regarding sort of these meditative states, I do think that any sort of manifestation of light in a meditative state is it's all part of this conversation. So I didn't want to get too trippy without making it more practical in that way. But yeah. All right. Any more questions, comments, answers, ideas about light? Jenny. Okay, two things. One is so that probably everybody here at some point had a break if like our conditioning is a thick sheet of ice that there are breaks that occasionally the light comes through right there are moments that we do have even in our normal dualistic life when we're meditating or we're just spacing out or doing our art there's there are those moments where right that there are light there is light that comes through and then for some reason in my mind, I'm connecting this to the Vajra Sutra because hmm. I didn't, I always thought of the diamond cutter, not so much as the diamond cutter, but like that flash of insight that happens, that is that light. Yes. It's vitally important that we know that Vajra is lightning. <laughs> And in particular, that flash of lightning, that, that sudden flash. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So we've kind of covered the, the tough beginning part of the poem where they're kind of, um, you know, stating basically these themes of emptiness and non-doing. But then we get into this interesting part. And by the way, this goes on for a very long time. Um, when I first, oh, I, didn't, I don't think I told you this. So when I first picked up the, this version and I was like, oh, you know, the manifest, manifestation of light. I gave it a quick glance. I was like, oh, those are ideas I'm really into. And I think everybody would really like them. It's only, you know, 10, 10 pages or so, little sutra, let's do this. Then I get my Chinese version. I begin kind of going through and translating. And then I realize, oh, they've done that thing again. They have abridged this so much. It's, it's really gnarly too. It's not even our normal... Um, like where it makes sense kind of they're just leaving stuff out left and right and so i got to tell you that if you're ever referring to this version of this sutra you're missing a lot now i kind of understand why they they abridged it because it's it's incredibly repetitive um you notice the part that i left off at so it begins these series of stanzas and the stanzas all are very very similar they say sometimes from a single light 
two colors emerge or, and then it goes on three colors, four colors, five colors, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. This is where <clears throat> they just decided to stop. They were like, Hey, okay, we're, we're done here. It's actually really interesting if you go through it all. So the first thing is, is that it says this weird thing about sometimes from a single light, two colors emerge all the way up. And, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't help but think of a prism. It's very much the image that comes to my mind is that idea of like refracting uh, uh, light. And so it splits into two colors or you could refract it. So it splits into the whole rainbow. I, with this light thing, I think there's so much metaphor going on that you would really be unwise to, to lock into any one meaning. But I think the prism is a helpful like visualization in that way. So from a single light, two colors, three colors, four, five, all the way down. Then it says this next part. So sometimes from a single light, two colors of light emerge. Each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. And then it says differentiated is how they appear, right? So actually on that note, I wanna just point this out to you. Differentiated is how they appear. My point is whether you're seeing the faces or whether you're seeing the glass, it arises, it appears as a product of differentiation, what you could also call discrimination. It's kind of alluding to that similarly regarding light, that it arises from differentiation or dis distinguishment in that way. So I, a lot of these ideas I think are going to you know, slowly revealed themselves in that way. Like, what is this poem really getting at? I don't, I still don't really know, frankly. We're just going through this together in that way. But it's definitely talking about the way we differentiate and distinguish things in that sense by different colors, for sure. <clears throat> but then what does it mean when it says from a single light, two colors emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower? I don't know. So they translated it as, interestingly, they decided each of the beams, each radiates three beams, higher, middle, and lower. I don't really read it that way. Um, I suppose you could read it that way. That gets to be a lot of light when each of the lights is refracting and then reflecting more. My feeling about the upper, middle, and lower, or high, middle, low, I think that there's a way in which you could understand that almost kind of scientifically, by which I mean, if you're familiar with radio waves or any kind of wave formation, you have the crest, you have the trough, and you have the middle bandwidth. So any waveform is actually going to have the upper register, the lower register, and the middle bandwidth. It's kind of like how radio even works are, is based upon the distinguishing of those three aspects of a wave. Again, the, the, the crest, the trough, and then that what would be called the middle bandwidth. So they might be getting into something wild there, but... I also can't help but feel like it's like, yeah, I know they're talking about light, but when I was reading this and I was trying to work with the actual language and trying to figure out what do they mean, each with an upper, middle, and a lower. And it kind of dawned on me when I was kind of reading further and I'm like, oh, well, this is a lot about distinction and discrimination in that sense. It made me realize like, Anything kind of has an upper, a middle, and you have an upper, a middle, and a lower. And there's a way in which it's almost like a, rather than duality, we can speak of triality. 
is that a word but like where not just dividing things into this and that but noticing a kind of it's it this actually has a lot to do with um uh you uh, any photographers or artists in the room are definitely going to be aware of thirds thinking of a frame in terms of thirds right like just that way of seeing things in terms of this side that side in the middle or up here middle lower it it kind of is a way of dis, of dividing things and so those are two suggestions when it says from one light, two colors emerge, each with an upper, lower, and a middle. You could think of it maybe as the actual wave formation of the color, almost like, you know, infrared. Infrared is really big in that way. So maybe they're talking about that, or maybe they're just talking about um, distinguishing these different colors in terms of in terms of upper, middle, and lower. And by the way, too, in Chinese, upper, middle, and lower, those terms could also mean um, like really good, mediocre, and poor. <laughs> it's, it's the way Chinese works too, where they, they could be referring to these as qualities, meaning like really good. So a kind of, if one light splits into two colors and each of those colors has a really like beautiful form, a kind of mediocre form and a lower lesser form in that way, that would be a, you know, again, it, it's, it's just, you could read the language that way, but it doesn't make perfect sense. Yes, Suzanne. Could you also interpret it as like Vedna, like positive, neutral, negative? Mm, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't only because of the, it's upper, middle, and lower. And that word middle is not what you would use if you wanted to indicate that type of neutrality okay. it's very spatial not yeah so i hear i i know what you're thinking or yeah okay oh that's just about time all right um which which is okay because we actually covered just the right amount of ground so now that we've kind of established the the basic ideas of the light but also the way that this sutra is going to go. This sutra just goes on. The Buddha answers our young boy moonlight for a very long time with a lot of different lights. They're all going to have this upper, middle, and lower thing. They're all going to be refracted. So we made good, uh, good, uh, good progress tonight. And then next week, we're going to really start getting into the more specific teaching. Like, what is this sutra really trying to tell us? Not beyond, you know, how to emit light in that sense, right? Okay, that's going to do it for me. Thank you, everybody, for being here for this new sutra. Um, pick it up next week.